Praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the workers training tonight. Thank you because we know that you are mightily present here. We're asking, Lord, that you open our eyes of understanding, that we'll see and behold, as well as experience, mighty power of your saving truth in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Psalm 51. And I'm reading from verses 12 and 13. Psalm 51, verses 12 and 13. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Here we find David, the psalmist, a king, a real child of God, a man that was called that he will do the will of God, the fullness, the entirety, the totality of the will of God. We know what had happened to him. But now, after what happened, happened, he wanted that salvation, the joy, the victory, and the assurance that that salvation has come back unto him. And so he prayed, and in his prayer, he said, Restore unto me, number one, your salvation, number two, the joy of salvation, then the assurance of salvation, the victory that comes through salvation, and the understanding of the relationship, reconciliation we have with God as the salvation comes in. And he wants that feeling again, that fellowship again, that friendliness again, and that interaction again, that intimacy again between him and the Almighty God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. He says, I know when that salvation is restored and the joy is restored, I will be upheld. I will stand with thy free spirit. Only then will I have the authority. Only then will I have the assignment. Only then will I have the assurance I can talk to other sinners too. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. It says there is sin, he will declare the word of salvation, the truth of salvation. The sinners is for their conversion, but he must have that conversion first, that salvation first, that victory he must have first. We're coming to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 76, Luke chapter 1, verse 76, it says, And thou child, this is um, Zechariah talking about the son John, and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. That's what a prophet does. That's what a preacher does. That's what a pastor does. To prepare the way of the Lord so that the people will see it clearly how to come to the Lord. Verse 77, to give the knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of sins. A preacher comes, a pastor comes, a soul winner comes, a believer comes to another one. And he stands before the people representing God and is calling them to salvation and is giving the knowledge of salvation unto the people. 
and then through that knowledge of salvation they will have the removal and the cleansing and the forgiveness and the remission and the washing away of their sin and then he tells us how that salvation comes how that remission removal of sin comes in verse 78 through the tender mercy of our god whereby the day spring from on high has visited us for 79 to give the light unto them that sit in darkness and also in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace salvation brings peace brings pardon brings forgiveness brings righteousness brings redemption and it says when that knowledge of salvation comes it will guide our feet in the way of peace the salvation of the lord grants us forgiveness freedom peace joy the fruit of the spirit but the preacher the soul winner the minister must declare that word of salvation for people to have a clear understanding of what it means to be saved and then you come to know the Lord. Tonight we're looking at the word of God on the subject proclaiming the gospel of salvation to every creature. Proclaiming the word, the grace, the good news, the gospel of salvation to every creature. Why tell everyone? Because he wants everyone saved. Why preach the gospel of salvation to every creature? Because he wants everyone to know, everyone to have, everyone to believe that word of salvation so that as they know, as they understand, they will take action and they will come into that gospel and as they believe, the truth of salvation, the reality of salvation will come unto them. Mark chapter 16, reading from verse 15. Mark 15, 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Reach everyone, touch everyone, enlighten everyone, preach to everyone, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That it says, you must do something about it. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved is the word of salvation, gospel of salvation. The truth of salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Tonight, as we bring the word on proclaiming the gospel of salvation to every creature, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, preaching repentance toward God before salvation the salvation doesn't just come to everybody there must be repentance preaching repentance toward god before salvation point number two after that salvation with the experience of that salvation with the knowledge of that salvation with the grace in that salvation that comes to man point number two Possessing the righteousness of God with salvation. Salvation is not just there in isolation dangling. It comes with righteousness. And as we believe the Lord, turn away from our sin and turn to the Lord, and we really have a genuine experience of salvation, righteousness will be visible. Possessing 
the righteousness of God with his salvation. And as we move on, as we leave on, point number three now, promoting the reign of God. God reigns. God has dominion. God controls. God leads. God conquers all that had been in man that made man to go away from him. But now God reigns in the heart, in the mind, in the life of the one that has salvation. Point number three, promoting the reign of God through salvation. He reigns in our hearts, in our lives, in our character, in our behavior. God reigns. And that reign of God comes through the salvation he has given to us. Promoting the reign of God through salvation. Point number one, preaching repentance toward God before salvation. Before somebody can truly be saved, he must repent of sin. But you must hear that from the preacher. The preacher must tell him or her that sin destroys and sin damps the soul and sin destroys and sin will bring eternal judgment. And so the only thing to do, the right thing to do will be to run away from that sin, to repent from the sin. And we, have, we find that the uniform testimony of scripture and the uniform proclamation of scripture there must be repentance before salvation without repentance there can be no salvation if a man is just thinking the man is just thinking okay i raise up my hand i receive him as my savior on what grounds you must turn from sin repent of sin turn away from darkness and come into the light and then you receive him as savior Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 14. Mark 1, verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Look at this, repent ye and believe the gospel. Every individual that hears the word, repent ye. And then after that, you believe the good news. Everyone that is coming to the knowledge of the sins he has committed, of the sins he has practiced, of the evil he has done, repent ye. It's personal. Repent ye at this present time. Repent ye all the sins that have been committed in the past. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's the way of salvation. That's what happens before salvation comes in. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 6. Luke chapter 3, verse 6. And all flesh shall see. The salvation of God. All flesh must hear. All flesh must know. All flesh will eventually see, those who believe, the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Salvation is available. And for you to come into that salvation, you must actually flee, run, get away, turn from the wrath to come. Verse 8, bring forth therefore the fruits worthy of repentance. For them to see the salvation of God, which he has provided, he says, 
they must bring forth the evidence, the product of repentance. There must be repentance before anyone will see the salvation of the Lord. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Repentance before salvation. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. You see the order there? Repentance first, and then after that, remission of sin. Repentance first, after that, forgiveness of the sins that are repented of. You confess and forsake the sin, and then there will be freedom from sin, there will be salvation. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. It's not peculiar to Israel. It's not peculiar to Jerusalem. Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Second Peter chapter 3. If we don't preach repentance and the people don't know the danger of continuing in sin, and they just think that salvation has come, is for everyone, raise up your hand, accept the salvation now, accept Jesus. They have their sin, they have Jesus on top. They have their evil, they have Jesus along with the evil. They have their iniquity, they have Jesus along with the iniquity. Salvation doesn't come that way. There must be the proclamation. There must be the preaching. There must be the declaration of repentance, Toward God before the salvation comes in. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All who want to experience the salvation of the Lord, they come to repentance. It's after that repentance, the conversion comes. After that repentance, the forgiveness comes. After that repentance, then they will be counted as children of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, reading from verse 19. Acts, chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. You see, repentance always comes first before the conversion, before the salvation, before the transformation. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. The sins will not be blotted out if there is no repentance. The one will not be cleansed if there is no repentance. And there will be no joy of salvation without repentance. There will be no assurance of salvation without repentance. Repent ye therefore and be comforted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing. The times of refreshing will come for the cleansing, for the pardon, for the grace with the adoption to the family of God, as repentance has taken place. It says, only then, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Was a blessing in turning every one of you from his 
iniquities. He grants us forgiveness and then he grants us salvation. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 30 and verse 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 30, verse 31. The God of our fathers restored Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted by his right hand to be a prince and a savior. How does he save? He gives repentance for to give repentance unto Israel. And after that repentance, he grants forgiveness of sins. It's false assurance to promise someone salvation without emphasizing repentance. That's why we have a lot of superficial people who say they are converts and they cannot obey the word of God. They cannot stand on the truth of God. They do not have the love, the joy, the delight in the word of God. They don't have the victory that salvation brings because the salvation is not real. They raised up their hands they said they gave their lives to the Lord, but there was no repentance preceding that. Look at that verse 31. Him, Christ. Him, the Savior. Him, our Lord and Master. Him, as God exalted by His right hand to be a prince and a Savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins please hold on to that understand that and when you are presenting the word of salvation to others make sure you remember they must know about the danger of sin the damnation of sin the evil sin in sin and the judgment that will come because of sin and they turn, turn away from their sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ after that repentance and salvation comes. Repentance first. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And in terms of this ignorance, God winged at the past ignorance, the foolish things that those sinners have done in their ignorance, lack of knowledge, and they have gone into all kinds of evil. The Lord is willing to overlook, willing to forgive, and willing to pass by, pass over all those things that happen. But one condition, look at this, but now commandes all men everywhere to repent. Now he commands, he expects, he demands, and it's a commandment of God now for every sinner if salvation is going to come. But now commandes all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. Acts chapter 20. Verses 20 and 21. And how I kept nothing that was profitable unto you. I kept back nothing. If we don't tell sinners about repentance, we're keeping back something profitable, something necessary, something indispensable, 
something that will be a new way, an open door to their salvation. We're denying them of having a genuine experience of salvation. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly on the pulpit and from house to house privately. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God. That's the first thing. It's seen out to know repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot jump over repentance and just say believe, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. He says, I've not kept anything back that was profitable unto you. And what's the profitable sin? Repentance toward God. And then after that repentance, there's faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 26. And I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 26, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Was the heavenly vision? Go and bring the people to the path of salvation. Tell them the good news. Preach the gospel. Call them to salvation. And was that a vision? What does it entail? Look at verse 20. But I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent. That's the heavenly vision, that they should repent. That's how they get the benefit of the salvation of Christ, that they should repent. They should turn, turn from evil, turn from sin, every form of sin, every shade of sin, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow Walkers, repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow. Now he understands, the sinner understands, sin is deadly. Sin is damning. Sin is destructive. And looking at the destruction coming because of the sins he has committed, he had sorrow of heart, sorrow and shame. And the pain of what he had done against the Lord grips him. And he does not want to keep on repeating that same thing. And get himself to offending God more and more. That's why it says he has sorrow. And it is godly sorrow. Is that godly sorrow that was repentance to salvation? Not to be regretted of, not to be repented of. But a sorrow of the world walkers days. If the person there has sorrow because of the consequence of sin, because of what he lost, because now the shame is a terrible sin, all that he has done has now come to the open and people are looking at him, so you did that, so you could have done that. And he has the sorrow of the world that will bring destruction. But if it's not because of the shame, it's because he sees the degradation and he sees the iniquity and he sees the offense against God. He says, Godly sorrow walks repentance not to be regretted of. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 24, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 
and a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Those who have gone astray and they are coming back to the Lord, that the Lord will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Only then will verse 26 occur and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verses 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that what cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. I'll disown you. I'll disherit you. I'll not have you anything to do with you. I will separate you from me and from my kingdom. Look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. You've seen it all over. If we're going to have the favor of God, restoration into his grace, restoration into his mercy, restoration into his kingdom, restoration of the salvation that he wants to give us. He wants us because he loves us. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. And then he says, be zealous therefore and repent. Then he says, behold, if you repent, behold, if you turn away from sin, behold, I stand at the door and know if any man hear my voice and he opens the door, I will come in to him. I will sup with him and he with me. And to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray that we will have ears to hear. You will have ears to hear. And our audience, the people we are talking to, either we are talking to them on an individual basis, or we are talking to them in a hall, in a church building, an audience, they will have ears to hear in Jesus' name. Let everybody shout, Amen. Point number two now, after repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the person who has said the word understands the word, he turns away from sin, he believes of the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation now comes in, and the Spirit of God bears witness in his heart that now he is saved. There is something that makes us to know that that salvation is real and that is righteousness. And as you look through the scriptures, you'll find righteousness and salvation attached together. If somebody has salvation, he has righteousness. If somebody manifests righteousness, is because salvation has come in. Those two words are inseparable in the life of a convert. 
in the life of a child of God. Salvation, righteousness, righteousness, salvation. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're looking at the connection between righteousness and salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. The chief thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Remember, Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans. I remember Paul, the apostle, and emphasized repentance, repentance, repentance all over. And as the person repents, and now he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he confesses with his mouth Jesus as Lord. He says, I shall believe in that heart that God raised him up from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, look at this, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You find those two words there in that verse 10. The righteousness and the salvation. He believes in the heart that leads him to righteousness. He confesses with the mouth that brings the salvation. Salvation and righteousness. I say chapter 45, reading from verse 8. The connection between righteousness and salvation. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 8. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. This is not self-righteousness. This one is coming from above, from the skies, from heaven, from the Lord himself. Drop down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. And that's why he now calls in verse 22, Look unto me, all ye the ends, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. He calls us to salvation, and thereby calls us to righteousness. He calls us to righteousness, and that righteousness comes through salvation. Salvation brings righteousness. Salvation makes us to live in righteousness. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has closed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Can you see those two words again? The experience of salvation brings practical righteousness. It gives us the strength and the grace and the power and the standing. To be able to live in righteousness, salvation comes and then immediately we find righteousness being possible in our lives. And this is for everyone. There's no exception. Anywhere you find salvation in that heart, in that life, you will find righteousness. Not self-righteousness, but the righteousness which comes by faith. And he says for everyone, is for whosoever, whosoever will. In Romans chapter 10 verse 13. Romans 
chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's for everyone. And when he calls, and that salvation is given, it comes with righteousness. And it is not that man is struggling now to be righteous, but the grace is there, the strength is there, the presence of Christ is there, and the power to live the righteous life is there because salvation has come in. Psalm 71, verse 15. Psalm 71, reading from verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation. My mouth shall show forth in testimony, in preaching, in declaration. My mouth shall show forth in declaration thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day for i know not the numbers thereof look at psalm 24 reading from verse 3 all through to verse 5 psalm 24 we're reading from verse 3 it says in psalm 24 verse 3 you shall ascend unto the heel of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Look at verse 5 now. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Righteousness from the God of his salvation. If God has saved that sinner, he will receive righteousness from the hands of that saving God. If the sins are forgiven, if the sins are taken away, if there's a new life, salvation comes with righteousness the past is forgiven the present is equipped and strengthened to live a righteous life if there is no righteousness we should still help the sinner to re-examine his profession if there's no change of life there's no newness in his character there's no newness in his behavior. And there is no evidence that Christ is living the victorious life in him and through him. We should help the person to examine the life, confess the sin, forsake the sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and real salvation will come. I said real salvation will come. Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse 13, Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Now that yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You claim salvation. You profess salvation. You testify to the salvation of the Lord. Then no longer yield your members as instruments of or righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What's the answer? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves 
servants to obey. His servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be sent that ye were servants of sin were in the past, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. That's what salvation brings, free from sin. That's what salvation does, free from sin. That's what salvation imparts to every life. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Chapter 8 of Romans, reading from verse 1. Chapter 8 of Romans, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Those are saved people. They are in Christ Jesus. They are not living in the world and living for the world and living by the world and living like the world anymore. It says they are now in Christ. In Christ Jesus. And because of that condemnation is gone. And they walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. A new life has come. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Salvation coming in brings a new law, a new oppression, a new mode of living, a new character, a new behavior, a new strength, a new focus in life. And that law of the spirit of life has made the convert free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He doesn't approve of sin when he comes sin as savior. He doesn't license sin when he comes sin as savior. He doesn't promote sin when he comes sin as savior. He doesn't encourage sin in any shape or shade or form. He condemns sin. And he clears away the sin. And then in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Salvation has come. Righteousness has come. Salvation has come. Newness of life has come. Salvation has come. And the grace to live in newness of life has now come that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. I pray the Lord will affirm and confirm that in us and in our converts in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, any man, anyone, any convert, any Christian, any professor, testifier, or being born again, anywhere, under any preacher, in any church. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, 
How many things have become new? All things have become new. And all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To which that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing the righteousness unto them. They have repented of them. They have turned away from them. They have confessed them. They have forsaken them. And those sins are cleansed away from their lives. Their sins are separated from them. And they are separated from their sins. And because of that now, he will not impute their trespasses unto them. But he has now committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you. In Christ's stead, if Christ were here, this is how we plead with you. Now he is not here physically. On his behalf, in Christ's stead, instead of Christ, don't expect him to come physically to you. We now stand for him on his behalf. And on his behalf, in Christ's stead, we beseech you, be ye reconciled unto God. And when you are reconciled and you are saved, what happens? Verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us, sin offering for us, sacrifice for sin for us, substitute for the sinner. He has made him to be the sin offering. To be the sin bearer, to be our substitute, and to be the sacrifice for us. He knew no sin that ye might be made, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Salvation comes and now we are the righteousness of God in him. I pray. This righteousness will be real in every life. So the people will not just be saying, I am saved, I am saved. And there's no evidence. And there's no righteousness. And there's no change. And there's no transformation. Salvation and righteousness will be joined together in every life. In Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 21, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt, According to the deceitful lost. If you claim to be saved, put them up. Old life, former life, corrupted life, licentious life, the evil life, the sinful life, corruption of the past with all the deception. Put everything up. Verse 23 and be renewed. In the spirit of your mind, that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Righteousness and true holiness. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, verse 10. Philippians 3, verse 9, and be found in him. Now that I'm saved, be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, self-righteousness, 
outward righteousness, traditional righteousness, Jewish righteousness, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the face of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we have the righteousness that he imparts unto us by faith. Salvation comes with righteousness. First John chapter 3 from verse 4. First John chapter 3 from verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away, not to increase, to take away, not to license, to take away, not to establish sin, but to take away our sin. In him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Because if salvation had been there, righteousness would have been there. Little children, let no man deceive you. And don't deceive yourself either. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, saved, adopted into the family of God, and he professes, I mean, Christ. Whosoever, anyone, anytime, in every generation, whosoever in the church, on the crusade field, whosoever is truly born of God, does not commit sin, does not continue in sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God. God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. If he does not do righteousness, does not practice righteousness, is not of God. It doesn't prove that he has salvation because salvation and righteousness go together. The new birth and righteousness go together. Conversion and righteousness go together. New life, righteousness, they go together. The grace of God in man and righteousness in that new man, they go together. He who is born of God becomes righteous. There's enough grace to make him live the righteous life. And people will see, and people will know he is righteous, that you are righteous, that I am righteous, that each one of us is righteous, that our converts to are righteous in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now, promoting the reign of God. The reigning, the dominion, the control, the direction, the power to do the will of God on earth as it is done in heaven. That God reigns in the life 
of the believer promoting the reign of God through salvation. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, thy God reigneth. He brings salvation. He promises salvation. He publishes salvation. He declares salvation. And he says, by that salvation, in that salvation, through that salvation that enters into the heart of man, thy God reigns. He comes in and he reigns in the heart and the life of the one that has now come into Christ and Christ has come into him. The world no longer reigns. Sin no longer reigns. Evil no longer reigns. And tradition no longer reigns. And evil and the past life no longer reigns or having dominion over his life. But now salvation comes in and as he plunges himself to that true grace of God, our God reigns. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah 26 verse 13. O Lord our God, all that Lord's beside thee have had dominion over us. As we were away in the wilderness of sin, all that Lord have reigned over us. As we turned our backs to you, and we didn't acknowledge you, we didn't allow you in our hearts, in our lives, all that Lord have reigned over us. As we didn't concentrate on your word, and we didn't soak in your word, believe your word, live by your word. All that lords have reigned over us. But by thee only, at this time now, we're going to reject, we're going to push off, we're going to throw off the dominion and the control and the reign of all those other lords. But now by thee only, will we make mention of thy name the Lord will reign in every one of our hearts Judges chapter 8 and I read from verse 22 Judges chapter 8 verse 22 then the men of Israel said unto Gideon rule thou over us both thou and thy sons, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. They didn't know who delivered them. It wasn't Gideon. It was God. He only used Gideon. Gideon was afraid. Gideon was fearful. Gideon was timid. Gideon was uncertain that you could do anything. Who am I? I'm the least in my father's house. And God said, I'll be with you. I will strengthen you. And then he gave him, he showed him the interpretation of the dream of the Midianites. And the Lord gave him courage. And then the Lord got all these people that were not very sure. They were afraid. He sent them back. And he said, by the 300 that lapped the water, like the dogs, I'll save Israel out of the hand of the Midianites. And those 300, they followed out of Gideon, and God gave them the victory. And the people now 
unknown to them that it was victory from God. They attributed the victory unto Gideon. But Gideon knew better. They said, rule over us because you have given us the victory. And then he said in verse 23, Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. And it's good for you to understand that God may use a human instrument in getting you saved, bringing you to the Lord, bringing you into salvation, into the kingdom of God. And you should not surrender your heart and your mind and the control of your life to that person because God used him. God is the Savior. God is the Redeemer. God is the one who has saved us. Gideon said, I am not the one that gave you the victory, that conquered the Midian, says God. I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The last line now, help me read it out, one, two, three, go. Say it, say it, say it aloud. Instead of you put me, then put your convert. The Lord shall rule over you and rule over your converts in Jesus' name. And when salvation comes, that's what happens. That God now sits on the throne of the heart and he reigns over that heart. The children of Israel made that mistake. They wanted a man to guide them, to rule them, to reign over them. And then they said they wanted a king. And it was a sorrowful day, a terrible day in the land of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I'm reading here from verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're reading him from verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hakin unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You know, religious people, religious people only do what is right when their bishops are there, when their pastors are there, when their reverends are there, when their leaders are there, when their ministers are there. Because it's the minister that rules over them. And it's the minister they are serving. It's the preacher they are serving. And it's their leader they are serving. It's the human instrument they are serving. And when that human instrument is around, then uh, they will seem to tow the way of the Lord. They do not have the understanding when we get saved, when we become children of God, it is God that reigns over us. And God is everywhere. God is behind that curtain. God is behind that closed door. God is with you in that place. He hears every conversation. And he sees every action. He knows the thought of the heart. He knows the action of the hand. He knows where you go. He sees you there. He knows who are your friends. He knows all of them. He knows what you practice together. But you know the people of the world who are only religious and they think, Pastor is not here. He's the one that reigns over us. The priest is not here. He's the one that reigns over us. And even if the pastor is here, he will not know about this. He cannot see farther than the sight can carry him. He will not see this one behind the wall. They do not understand that when salvation comes in, we now allow the Lord to reign over us. I pray what they didn't understand, we understand. I understand. You understand in Jesus' name. And we allow, we promote the reign of God through the salvation that we have. Look at that last line of verse 7 for Samuel chapter 8. But they have rejected me, God says, that I should not reign over them. The Lord 
will reign over us. Sin will not reign over us. In our heart, sin will not reign. In our mouth, sin will not reign. In our character, sin will not reign. In a place of war, corruption will not reign over us. Fraud will not reign over us. Iniquity will not reign over us. God will reign over us in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 19. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 19, we're looking at it from verse 7. It says, The law of the law is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. You see what conversion does when we come to the Lord? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired at they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, is thy servant want, and in the keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me, cleanse thou me, porch me, purify me, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Look at verse 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Will for sin, let it not have dominion over me. Besetting sin, let it not have dominion over me. And sin that is careless, that just comes in anytime, every time, let them not have dominion over me. The Almighty will have dominion over you. Christ will have dominion over you. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 133. Psalm 119. And verse 133, order my steps in thy word. Take care of my life. Take over my life. Order my life. Order my steps. Order my action. Order my utterance. Order my behavior. Order my lifestyle. Be the one that is in charge. And give me the order. And give me the directives and give me the way I should walk. I don't want to walk in my own strength or in my own power. I don't want to walk with only my intelligence, but order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Let not any iniquity in the office, any iniquity in the community, any iniquity in the area I am used to, any iniquity of strangers or friends, let not any iniquity of my past life or the lives of other people, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. You see, that's the one that realizes that when salvation comes, then the rule of God comes. The reign of God comes and the dominion of God comes. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin. Dead indeed unto sin. Let's say somebody had been in your life. He controlled your life. 
and you feared that individual and the fear made you cringe, the fear made you submit, the fear made you just surrender your heart, your life, your past, your present, your future. But now the fear, the man is dead or the woman is dead or the tyrant is dead or the bully is dead. It says now, that's the way we should look at sin, that now sin is dead unto you, you will not have control over your life. And a man, a woman, whoever that had the control over your life will drag you into sin because you feared him. You couldn't live your life free. You live by the fear of that man or that woman. Now you count that woman as dead unto you. They don't have any control anymore. I was waiting for a good amen. Likewise, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Let it not reign. God has now come. Christ now lives inside your heart. And sin will not take the upper hand. Christ will reign in your life. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey each in the lusts thereof. Sin will not reign over me. The Savior will reign in my life. It is confirmed in Jesus' name. James chapter 4, reading from verse 7. James chapter 4, reading from verse 7. In James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. In every consideration, Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. In every circumstance, Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. In every activity, Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Don't put God and any man side by side. Looking here and looking there, when there is something to be done, an action to be taken, a word to be given, a life to live. Should I obey God? Look at his side. Should I obey man? Look at his side. And then you see the man and he's beckoning to you and he's trying to control you. And then you say, sorry God, this man is reigning over me. This man is having dominion over me. I cannot submit to you now. Wait for another time. I will submit to this man now. God forbid your life. The pony man, poor man, simple man, backsliding man, or even a believing man will take the upper hand in your life God will reign over your life in Jesus' name. God will be above your boss in the office. God will be above your manager in the office. God will be above the preacher in your life in Jesus' name. And you submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Even Satan will not reign over your life. Receives the devil and he will flee from you. I know he will flee from me. I said I will, I know he will flee from me. He will not have the upper hand in your life in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else they will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Ye cannot serve God and a man.
Ye cannot serve God and money. Ye cannot serve God and tradition. Ye cannot serve God and a religious personality. You must make up your mind. Who reigns in your life? God will reign in your life. Him and him only will you serve. A man will not become so strong in your life that you forget God and then allow God to step aside and that man is the one dictating every order and every step of your life. God will be the visible Lord of your life in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 4, verse 8, promoting the reign of God through salvation, you're saved, you'll promote the reign of God. Luke chapter 4, verse 8, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. He will be behind you. Satan will not be in front of you. He will not be beckoning to you. He will not be controlling your life. He will not be ordering your steps. He will not tie a rope in your hand and pulling you around. You will not be the footmat of Satan in Jesus' name. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and tell me and tell me underline the word only there and say it with the underlining of the word only in unison one two three go and him only shall thou serve no rival no competition no giving your heart to any man, anywhere. God will reign in your life without a rival in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there's no argument. In heaven, there's no rivalry. In heaven, there's no competition. God reigns, and God reigns supreme over the angels and over just men made perfect who live in heaven. And it says over here on earth, when we have the salvation of God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the Almighty God will reign in our lives. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 19. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all you bring yourself in subjection to the lord the lord rules over all you say you are saved you belong to him without any reservation the lord in his kingdom rules over all you say he is the one reigning and is sitting on the throne of your heart his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, act me in unto the voice of his word. The angels, without any exception in heaven, they allow him to reign. They allow him to rule over their action, over their disposition over their thoughts, over everything concerning them. He reigns without a rival. And the Lord has taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Those of us who profess to be saved and were children of God, he 
will reign in our lives in Jesus' name. Verse 21, bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. That do his pleasure, his pleasure only will we do. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. Your soul will bless the Lord. Your life will bless the Lord. Your character will bless the Lord. Your ministry will bless the Lord. Your converts will bless the Lord. As you present salvation to them, repentance before that salvation, righteousness with that salvation, and that salvation takes root and effect in your life, in my life, in your heart, in my heart, in my ministry, in your ministry, in the church, in our church. God will reign without a rival in Jesus' name. Promote that reign, exalt that reign, uplift that reign. Everywhere you go, let the word of God reign. Everywhere you go, let the doctrine of righteousness reign. Everywhere you go, let the light of the gospel reign. Everywhere you go, let them know that God is reigning, Christ is exalted, and you are there as representatives of the Lord, and the Lord will go with you. The Lord will be with you. All the strength you need, He will give you. All the power you need, He'll give you. All the grace you need, He will give you. Christ must reign. He will start there in your heart. He will reign in your life. Let's rise up. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord today. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, my Lord Jesus. Reign, my King Jesus. Reign, my Savior Jesus. Reign, you are the Redeemer. Reign, you are the one that paid the price for my salvation. Reign, I surrender afresh. Absolute surrender. Total surrender. Complete surrender unto you. I surrender, submit everything to you afresh today. Come and reign in my life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let him reign without a rival. Let him rule without a rival. Any other thing that is trying to have dominion, push them aside and turn away from them and say, the Lord will reign. On my tongue, the Lord will reign. In my heart, the Lord will reign. In my thoughts, the Lord will reign. In my disposition, the Lord will reign. In my plans, the Lord will reign. In the places I go, the Lord will reign. In the projects I try to do, the Lord will reign. Only the Lord will reign. Reign, Lord Jesus. Reign in power. Reign, Lord Jesus. Reign in your grace. Reign, Lord Jesus. Reign in your mind. There's no part of my life I'm reserving, I'm taking away. There's no part of my life I want to personally, selfishly control. Self will not have dominion over me. Society will not have dominion over me. Tradition will not have dominion over me. My former behavior, my former lifestyle will not have dominion over me. Fear will not have dominion over me. My boss in the office will not have dominion over me. And the people in my community will not have dominion over me. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign. Have dominion over my life. Everything I do, everywhere I go, whatsoever I say, my character, my behavior, my lifestyle. Reign, Master Jesus. Satan and Christ the Savior cannot reign on the same throne. Light and darkness will not reign in the same heart. Good and evil will not reign in the same heart. Your saved, Christ will reign. You are a child of God. Your Father in heaven will reign over your life, over every decision of your life. 
you will do his will. You delight in his will. Know that Lord will reign in your life. Christ will reign without a rival. His word will reign without a rival. His truth must reign without a rival. Let him reign. Don't bring man side by side with God. Don't bring any man, any woman in your life in competition with God. Let God reign. Let him reign supreme. Let his word be final. No one else to have dominion over your life. He must reign. He must reign. He will reign. If you are saved, surrender every area of your life to him. Surrender every department of your life to him. Let him reign. Let him reign. Do you just speak any word? Let those words be the words he approves of. The words he ordained. The life that pleases him. Let the Lord reign in every area and department of your life. He will reign. He must reign. Let him reign over your attitude. Let him reign over your decisions. Let him reign over your plans. Self must not continue to reign. But behavior must not continue to reign. Evil must not continue to reign. Hypocrisy must not continue to reign. Let Christ reign in your heart without your rival. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God, ministers of God, in Jesus' name we pray. Christ has now taken the supremacy in your life. He has dominion over your life. Satan is gone. Behind you in Jesus' name. In your life, Christ will reign supreme. In your business, Christ will reign supreme. And great things will continue to happen in your life. The past is gone. A new day has begun. And the new thing Christ will do as it comes to reign, you will see your life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name. We thank you because we're your children. We're your servants. We're your ministers. You have called us and we have responded. And we pray that your call will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. We will proclaim the gospel of salvation. And any time we're proclaiming the word, if we forget the importance of, re of a repentance, remind us in Jesus' name. And as we preach the word of repentance before salvation, 
I pray, Lord, your spirit will take the word from my mouth and make it effective and powerful in every line in Jesus' name. Many will turn to the Lord. They will forsake their sin. They will forsake darkness. They will forsake evil. They will forsake occultism. They will forsake evil powers. And they will turn fully wholeheartedly unto the Lord as their Savior in Jesus' name. Grant them Bible salvation. Victorious salvation. And let your righteousness come into them in Jesus' name. On us here, brothers and sisters, men of God, women of God, your righteousness will go deeper in every heart, higher in every life. And Lord, we pray that your righteousness will cover every area of our lives in Jesus' name. Afresh, we present ourselves before you. You are the only one that will reign and rule and control and govern and have dominion in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We dethrone every usurper. We dethrone every rival. And we dethrone every competitor in Jesus' name. Reign supreme. Reign without a rival. Reign without any competition. Reign in our heart. Reign in our spirit. Reign in our soul. Reign in our body. Sickness will not reign in our body. Evil powers oppression will not reign in our system. Anything that is not of God Come out in Jesus' name. You reign from the top of our head to the tip of our toes. We're victorious. We're now fully, completely in your kingdom. And the full provision of your kingdom will spread to everyone. Bless everyone. Touch everyone. Reign supreme in everyone's life. As we are reigning in our lives, we are going back home now. Clear every enemy out of the way. And Lord, I pray, create the platform for every one of your children in a practical way to reign in life in Jesus' name. Make this work of God prosper in their hands. I thank you because, because I know it is done. In Jesus' name we pray.